I guess I could start by introducing myself. Uh, I'm Kevin Berkland. Uh, I, w I am a teacher here and a Linux enthusiast. Uh, I teach in the IT program. Uh, actually, this quarter I'm teaching three Linux classes and an advanced networking class. So uh, I, I really enjoy Linux. I've been working with it for years. Uh, and one of the things that I noticed that Linux Fest was really kind of missing was a beginner's talk, a talk that's just like, hey, what is all of this stuff about? So I decided to make one. All right, so here's my disclaimer, uh, because I do work here and I do help put on the fest and all of that stuff. So the views expressed here are mine. They don't reflect that of BTC's campus or staff or Linux Fest as a whole. If I say something that offends you, don't get upset at the fest, get upset at me. Uh, the opinions that are expressed are just that, opinions. <coughs> Uh, if you disagree with my opinions, feel free to talk to me after the lecture, but please don't interrupt my lecture. Uh, e even even if like I, I say something that you find very offensive, like I don't know that Linux is better than Windows or Mac OS, <laughs> you know, something super offensive. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the first question is, what is Linux? Uh, it's an operating system. Uh, just like Windows or Mac OS, it's an uh, operating system. It allows your computer to boot up, operate. Uh, you can do stuff with it. You can browse the web. You can get to Facebook. You can send emails. You can host servers. You can play video games. It's, it's just a normal computer operating system. And where it gets its name is from its kernel. Uh, the kernel that runs Linux is the Linux kernel. And I know that I'm going to be throwing some jargon at you, so let's get this out of the way. Uh, not talking about this when I'm talking about a kernel. I'm talking about more something like this. So the kernel is the part that translates between the software on your system and the CPU, the memory, all of the physical bits of your computer. It's a translation layer. Kind of like if you have two different groups of people, two different friend groups, and you're trying to bring them together, and you kind of have to act as middleman to, to make sure that they all get to know each other and can, can understand each other. The kernel is the middleman of the operating system. So it's really quite interesting the way it works, um, but it's not the full operating system. So it just gets its name from this one small portion. Um, Another question that I hear a lot is, why should I care? Uh, like, why do 2,000 people show up at 9.30 on a Sunday morning and stand in a long line to get badges? <laughs> it's, it's really about freedom. Um, and so in the, in the vein of defining things as we go along, I don't mean freedom like free beer, free beer tickets. It, it's it's not freedom as in it's free. I mean, most versions of Linux are free as in you can just take them, install them, you don't have to pay any money for them. But that's not the freedom that gets people excited. It's more like this, where if you give out the recipe to make the beer, and then anyone can make the beer, and you can modify the beer, and change the beer, and create your own beer, and share that recipe with other people so that they can modify and create and change it. That's, that's the big thing that gets people excited about Linux, is anything that you do with it, somebody else can take what you've worked with, decide that they want to change something about it, create their own thing. You can say, oh, that's really good, incorporate it back into the thing that you're making, the thing that you're using, and it ends up making it so that we, as a community, have things that honestly take thousands and thousands and thousands of man hours to create, and we end up with a free product that gives us that, like audio mixing suites and web browsers. Like, anyone here ever use Firefox? <laughs> Open source project, completely free. That's why you can download it for free. You can also get the source code. I think they also recently made their logo and name open source, so now they're actually free, like, entirely. So we might not need Ice Weasel anymore, which Ice Weasel is, we'll, we'll get into Ice Weasel later. <laughs> okay, so, what is it good for? Uh, so Linux, 
has some PR stuff that it's trying to get over. Uh, mostly the fact that we're just not good as a community of advertising ourselves. Um, like, the idea of what operating system you want to install, you're like, okay, I want to give Linux a shot. And we're like, oh, no, actually, you got to pick, like, one of these 800 different things. So we're not really that great at advertising ourselves. But there's one sector of the world that Linux is fantastic at, and that's servers. And once again, not like this. <laughs> More like this. So this is a data center for Google, uh, and I would bet you guys a lot of money that at least four out of five of the computers in this shot are running Linux. Uh, actually, it's probably closer to all of them because Google is a Linux heavy shop, but um, just a quick show of hands, who here has used the internet before? <laughs> <laughs> So, 79% of the internet is run on Linux. Uh, it is, like, in the desktop game, Microsoft's beaten us. In the server game, we're winning hands down. So, anytime you go to Facebook, they use Linux servers. You go to Google, they use Linux servers. You go to some random website to, to get information about a game that you're interested in or a book that's coming out. Chances are it's running on Linux servers. So this is kind of why Linux has managed to grow and survive for so long. It's just because it is used literally everywhere. Um, but now you may be asking yourself, how can I use it? I don't, I don't have servers. I'm just here to have some fun. Uh, and there's a lot of flavors of Linux desktop. So uh, just to name off a few, there's Ubuntu, there's Fedora, there's Arch. There's uh, Gentoo, there's Red Hat, there's OpenSUSE, there's CentOS, and the list just keeps going on and on. And these are all what are referred to as different distributions or flavors of Linux. So, Windows has one flavor. You, you know it, you've seen it. Well, there's Windows 7 and Windows 10. So well, so, yeah, yeah they're, they're two different <coughs> versions of it, but they're still the same windows. There's still the same people working on the back end. In Linux, that's not really the case. And Windows, I mean, you can change it how it looks slightly, like you can change the color of these little squares <laughs> in your desktop background. They'll let you change that up. But pretty much, you're going to get this if you install Windows 10. Mac OS, also one flavor. They, they have different versions as well. Uh, you know, but if you download the latest and greatest, you're going to get something that looks mostly like this. And you're going to have to buy it on their hardware for the most part as well. Linux, on the other hand, this is not even close to everything, but this is a timeline of Linux distributions from the creation of Linux onward to, like, what we have today and all of these are different branching paths where somebody has said hey I like what you're doing but I want to do this one thing a little differently and they fork the process they, they take a copy of what the other people have been working on say hey I want to change a little bit of it for myself I think this is a really cool thing and I want to add it in and then they do that and they release it free and the other people are like hey that's really cool can I help you with that project I, I noticed this other thing that could also be added to it and eventually you end up with Linux distributions that are like forks of forks so like somebody has taken something changed it somebody else sees the changed one is like that's cool let's change it again and then you get your uh, like I think this is the Debian line Debian line splits off and then there's Ubuntu and Ubuntu like splits off into a million things and it, it's crazy. Linux has so much different options and if you are a little overwhelmed by this I do have a lecture tomorrow on choosing the right distro for you where I'll get more in depth onto the differences between all of these. Well not all of them but a few of the main <laughs> ones. <laughs> I, I'd never be able to stop talking if I did all of them. All right. 
So let's talk about some people involved in the Linux operating system because these are names that are going to come up and you guys probably should know them. So first off we have Linus Torvalds. Uh, he is a Finnish computer programmer that now lives in Portland, Oregon uh, and he created the Linux kernel and he didn't create it and then release it like you know, a, a full-fledged version of Windows 7 just drops on the market and it's like, hey guys, use this stuff. Uh, when he created the Linux kernel, he was in college and he ended up working on it as just kind of a fun pet project to hone his programming skills. And he was just messing around and eventually got to the point where he was kind of proud of it and he posted it on the internet. He's like, hey, I, I know this isn't you know as great or as cool as you know the stuff you guys are working on, but I think it's pretty neat. You guys want to help me work on this? And the answer was a resounding yes. Everyone like started using the Linux kernel. It, it grew and uh, it was created in 1991. By 1999, it was just insane, its adoption rate, and now, like as I was saying, as of 2014, 79% of servers in the world are running some form of Linux. Okay, so this is the next man that you guys should know about. Uh, Richard Stallman, uh, or Saint Ignatius of the Church of Emacs. Uh, <laughs> so this guy, is a bona fide genius. Um, so there's this thing called GNU, which we will get into in vocab in just a second, but he created this thing called GNU. Uh, and GNU, strictly speaking, is more of the operating system of Linux than the kernel is. He created this, and he also has been a huge proponent for freedom in all of its forms. He, if it was not for this man steering the ship, the internet as we know it today would not exist. He is, some would say, a hardliner. Um, he definitely has very strong opinions about freedom, but we need people like this in the community to uh, kind of push us forward, push us towards a more free way of thinking. Um, so he, one of his big accomplishments was he created the uh, GNOME C compiler. Or not, no, uh, GNU C compiler. Sorry, that was a huge mistake. Uh, but he he created that, and without that, we really wouldn't have Linux as an operating system today because it's what allows us to compile stuff in a free way to be used as programs on the operating system. All right, so the next person that you should know is Tux. Um, some of you may be asking, why are there so many penguins? Uh, that's because Tux is the mascot of Linux. Uh, he is a friendly little penguin, uh, and he is also free. Like, you can use Tux for whatever artwork you want, and there is some weird stuff on the internet that's just <laughs> pictures of Tux. Um, but he is the mascot of Linux. So if you see penguin stuff around, understand that it's because Tux is cool. Everyone wants to be friends with Tux. Tux is your friend. All right, let's get into some jargon, some vocab. All right, so this is GNU. Uh, not not this literally. This is a this is a African uh, savanna animal. It's very cool, but this is the GNU I want to talk about, uh, and. Notice that I have GNU slash Linux over here. Uh, so one of the big things, one of the big sticking points in Linux is since GNU is technically more of the operating system than Linux, uh, Richard Stallman and his followers believe that it should be better represented in the naming of it. Uh, so they have coined this term GNU forward slash Linux. Uh, GNU is a suite of software programs uh, that allow Linux to function. It's about 14% of the operating system, give or take, nowadays, is all GNU-based programs. And it's a really interesting thing. I'm not here to, to side one side or the other of this issue, but... GNU is definitely 
the main driving force behind the freedom of the Linux operating system. And they do this with the general public license, the GPL. Um, and I know software licensing, everyone's favorite topic. <laughs> but the GPL is a really, to, to boil it down to its most simplistic state, it says, hey, all of this stuff that I've made, you can use it, you can take it, you can change it, you can add whatever you want to it. You just have to also release it under the GPL. So it's kind of like the Borg. You will be assimilated if you use the GPL. Anything that touches the GPL becomes GPL itself. Um, it, it's a really cool way of making sure that software stays open, that somebody can't just take a really cool open source project and then close source it and start working on it in the background. It's the thing that has kept the internet innovating, it's kept us innovating, and it's one of the reasons that Linux is so beloved by all the people that use it. So without GNU, we'd really kind of be lost. So that's why I've added the GNU slash Linux slide to, to give my props to them. Uh, I'm going to go back to calling it Linux. <laughs> All right, so uh, Bash. Bash is the command line operating system of Linux. Um, so when you open up the command line, you end up, you, you get a little, little text. Anyone ever open a command line before? Yeah. Okay, so I don't need to explain that too much. Bash is the interpreter that it uses. Uh, it actually stands for Born Again Shell because SH, uh, Shell, was the original interpreter for Linux. And then after a while, people started working on it, and they're like, we can do better. And version 2, the, the enhanced version, became Bash, Born Again Shell. Uh, and this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, this is someone running a couple of commands. This slide's not super interesting. So I'm going to move on. So let's talk about root. Uh, so root is a user in the Linux ecosystem. Um, you'll, you'll hear the term root thrown around and you'll see joke shirts that are like, uh, obey me because I am root or anything along those lines. The reason that you're going to see these is because root is the administrative account. It's, it's the super user. It's the super user. Yeah. <laughs> I really like that picture. Um, so to frame this in a way that you guys might better understand, um, so in Windows, you have your administrative account. And your administrative account lets you do most things, but there's a few things that it just won't let you do. There's a few protections and safeguards and that sort of stuff where it's like, no, we know best. You, you can't do this. In Linux, root is the final authority, and you have that right out of the box. If you wanted to, you can use root to set up a web server or create a program. You could write Minecraft as the root user. You can also delete your entire operating system with a single line of code. <laughs> so it's the double-edged sword of Linux, and it's one of the reasons why we haven't really taken off in the desktop space. When, when you're giving somebody that might be new to the computer the ability to absolutely trash the system right out of the box, it, it can be a little bit uh, of a daunting task. But as long as you're careful with it, root is one of the coolest, most powerful things that you can use in the Linux operating system. All right. Let's talk about one of the things that Linux is just flat out better than Windows at. Downloading <coughs> programs. Uh, anyone ever have a situation like this where you're trying to get an antivirus or something off the internet and you end up with like 40 download buttons for viruses mm -hmm. and one hidden download button for the actual thing that you wanted? Member class? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is one of my students and he ended up clicking one of these green buttons in one of his first classes. Uh, it was it was an interesting learning yeah, experience. Well, so the idea behind 
Linux is instead of doing that, we have what is called a package manager. And uh, this is a prettier version that I chose to show. Package managers typically are command line. Uh, but a few years ago, uh, Ubuntu started its app store. Uh, and other people started following suit. And pretty much any program that you want to install on Linux exists in here. It's a one click to install thing. And you always get what you ask for. You never have to worry about getting viruses. You, uh, well, not never, but you very rarely have to worry about getting viruses um, because you're always getting it from a verified, reputable source. Everything that you get for Linux is available and easy and just right there. Um, so I assume you've all used an app store before, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, with your phone. Oh, also speaking of phones, if we go back to the root topic, has anyone heard the term rooting your phone? That is to get the root user, as in Linux. Uh, Android phones run Linux, by the way. So you, if you didn't know that, you have a little Linux computer in your pocket. So you're going to show me how to use root then. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the end of my slide deck, but I wanted to save a good section of this class for one, Q&A, and two, letting you guys know where you can go from here to learn more information about Linux. Uh, so you guys are at Linux Fest Northwest, one of the premier uh, Linux festivals in the U.S. Where we have roughly 2,000 people show up here every year. And just over on the other side of that wall, there are booths, there are people, there are nerds that would love to talk to you about their favorite operating system or their favorite program and why it got them excited and what they did to help contribute to this process. They are super cool. Also, in your pamphlets, there's a whole bunch of other classes and lectures and talks that you can go to. They are also really cool. But pretty much all you need to do to enjoy and start learning about Linux is just try it out. Uh, there is a program called VirtualBox that you can get that will allow you to install a virtual machine on, of Linux on any operating system that you want. And you can try it out risk-free at home. It is super simple to do. There are walkthroughs all over the internet. I highly recommend checking it out. All right, so, questions? What's up? back to the bash yeah. page? Totally. What's up? Do you have a question There's about a lot it? Of details in there. I can't oh, yeah. These commands. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, these commands. So it starts up at the top. There's PWD. Uh, that stands for Present Working Directory. It lets you know what directory you're currently in in the command line. Uh, next up, we have ls al. That gives you a list of what files are in the current directory that you're in. And uh, it gives you all of the files, including the hidden files in the Linux operating system, and it gives it to you in the long list format. So it allows you to see more information about the uh, file in the folder. Then he's using the cat command. The cat command allows you to uh, take information from a file and put it to standard output, which is just printed on the command line. So he's catting a file. And then He's using sudo <coughs> etsy initd bluetooth status, so he's checking the status of his bluetooth on his, com on his computer. Uh, tell him sudo, tell him what sudo is. Oh yeah. So sudo, if we come back over to the root slide. <laughs> uh, so, notice the s and the u are capitalized in super user. Sudo is literally super user do. It allows you to run a single command as root without having to be root yourself. And most Linux distributions allow you to have a uh, <coughs> user right off the bat that can sudo. So you can ruin one thing and not your whole thing. <laughs> exactly. <coughs> What's up? So two questions. One, so you've just rattled off some of the commands. Yeah. Um, 
Are those common to all distributions? Yes. And do those become different in different distributions? Nope. Uh, the command line is pretty much the same throughout all Linux distributions with a few like fringe case outliers. Um, the, the basic set of commands mm -hmm. will be the same if you go from an Ubuntu to a Fedora to an OpenSUSE to a Red Hat. It will all be the same. And, and then could you speak to some of the variations either for a, a beginner or for kind of the purposes that drive those different variations? Oh, yeah. So um, let's take a look at uh, Red Hat, CentOS, and Fedora as a good example of Linux distributions. Mm -hmm. They all are based off of the same progenitor, Red Hat. Uh, Red Hat was one of the first enterprise Linux, meaning that it's one of the few Linux that you pay for, but you're not paying for the software, you're paying for support. Uh, Red Hat was created and it was really cool and a lot of businesses started using it. And then people are like, hey, this is a cool project, but I kinda want a free version to like start monkeying around with. I can't remember which one came first, but I think it was Fedora. Uh, and Fedora's like, hey, let's let's take this enterprise like workstation level Linux and turn it into something that anyone can use. Let's let's make it user friendly. Let's make it free, and let's make it cool for everyone. And they started doing that, and they started doing what is called a leading edge distro. Like the moment that programs started coming out, they would test it, they would implement it, and you would have that package hopefully in the next day in your operating system. So. The developers get done working on it, they hit the button to submit it, and then one day later it's in your operating system. What's up? I was questioning whether we should mention that the different distributions are quite often related to specific processors, like like Raspbian works well, with a particular processor, it doesn't work on other True. Raspbian is, though, kind of a unique case because that was created specifically for the Raspberry Pi, the, the tiny Linux microcomputer. Um, now, you can also install other distributions on it, like Ubuntu will work on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, I think you need to use uh, the Mate desktop manager for it to run well, but you can install that on a Raspberry Pi as well. Well, see, what I'm getting at is that they optimize things for particular hardware created new distributions specifically targeted at, at unique hardware. Mm -hmm. there, there definitely is that, um, but in the, in the more general scope of things, uh, Linux can really be installed on just about anything you want. Uh, oh, actually, I'm going to finish up the, the analogy that I was doing with uh, Fedora and CentOS. Um, so Fedora was created and it was designed for the end user. But that's still left a fa space left to fill in the market of a enterprise quality <coughs> Linux that you don't have to pay for support. And then CentOS came out and was like, hey, let's make a free version of Red Hat without the support and just release it to everyone. And that's what they did. They, they took the source code from Red Hat, created a fork, yanked out all the stuff that said that you needed to have a, a license for it. And they're like, hey, you. You know, if you break something, you have to fix it yourself, but you can use this. And that's really one of the cool things about the Linux community. Like, from one distribution, like, you can get all of these different use case scenarios. What's up? How many different types of variables? Like, top hat, Ubuntu? What? How many, like, different kinds? Like oh, oh, how many different types of Linux? Yeah. Uh, hundreds, if not thousands. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Distro watch. Yeah. What's yeah. up? Do you think any new user actually needs to learn anything about command line commands? So you don't if you are, depending on what you're using your computer for. Uh, if you are, use your computer to get to your online banking, to websites, to you know do Word documents and uh, send emails to your kids or your friends, you do not need to touch the command line at all. Linux has gotten to be the point where you can just set it up and it runs and it works. Now, if you want to get into some of the stuff that I find really cool, like you know, setting up your own web server, then you do have to start touching the command line. All right, we'll do you and then you. Just can you recommend textbooks or? or um, uh, so I started out uh, with a textbook for Ubuntu. I, th I think it, they just release one with every version. 
Um, but that was more for like learning how to do system administrator stuff. Um, for home user, I would recommend YouTube actually. YouTube has a ton of information on it. Uh, you can look up just about anything. That and mm. Google, you all of it's out there for free. Uh, especially if you start with one of the more popular distribu just distributions like Ubuntu or uh, Fedora, Mint. Mint. Mint is a very good one. Um, they all have huge user groups that if you have any questions, you can just post a message on their forum and within minutes most of the time, there'll be like four or five people ready to help you out with whatever you have questions on. So for the benefit of new users, um, and in line with what you were saying about, for example, setting up your own web server, I've often found one of the overlooked features of Linux is the built-in manual. Maybe you could speak about that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <coughs> so if you ever do start getting into the command line, they've built a manual system into the command line. Any program that you want more information on, you just type the word man, space the program, and it will give you information on all the ways that it can be used. And then they actually, there's actually two more different ways of getting information out. If you just need a little bit of help, whatever the command is, if you do a space dash dash help at the end, it will just give you the most pertinent information, the most commonly used ways of it. And then there's also this info command. <coughs> if you do info space the command, it will give you history of the command, who created it, why, what it was intended for, different use case scenarios, it's a ton of information, and it's a great way to kill a Sunday if you're really nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any more questions? Oh, I've okay. got two. Yeah. Um, I was wondering about virtual admin. Is that like VBox? Uh, yeah, virtual admin's a lot like VBox. Um, you can pretty much any virtualization system that you want to use just, I recommend virtualizing Linux first before you install it on a computer because, you know, some of the times, it, it's a sad truth, but not all of your programs that you use in Windows will work in Linux. It's, it's a different operating system, and it takes a little bit of getting used to, so I recommend virtualizing first, and that way you can hop to a bunch of distros, like, you can try out Ubuntu for a day, and then move over to Linux Mint, and then give Fedora a shot, but you can pretty much do whatever you want. And my other question was, uh... Uh, does Linux have a task manager? Yes, uh, it actually has a couple. So there is uh, the PS command will tell you what processes are currently running, and you can use kill to kill those processes. There's also top. Top is a more graphical one, kind of like the uh, Windows task manager. But what I would really recommend is uh, it's not installed on a lot of them by default, but you can install it just by clicking a button. It's called HTOP. And it's top, but a little bit nicer looking, and you can click on things like sort by what's using the most CPU or memory. It, it's a really great program. All right. Um, for people who are trying to get started with Linux, I think one of the big developments has been the Raspberry Pi and Raspberry Pi Foundation. Oh, yes. You spend uh, $35 and up, maybe up more than 100 bucks. Slow, pretty much Debian. Yeah, it's slow. And it's really cheap. And you can buy your hard drives as SD cards at Walmart on yeah. a Sunday afternoon. Yeah. Yep. Yep. What's a comment on that, too? The Raspberry Pi Foundation, yep. if you go to their website, they publish approximately 100 page magazine every month. Mm -hmm. uh, you can subscribe to it fairly expensive, but you can go to their site and download the PDF of it for free. Cool. It's got yeah. projects, coding, and everything every month. So. In the back. Um, a recommendation, a good video to watch on the history of Linux. Oh yeah. Revolution uh, OS. Yeah, Revolution OS. I, I was I was gonna say the same thing. It is a fantastic video. It's all about what went into creating this operating system. If you're uh, if you like history and if you like nerdy things, I really recommend checking it out. Uh, Richard Stallman, I believe, back in the early days, wrote a fascinating book called Cuckoo's Egg. I haven't heard of that one. University of California, Berkeley, is a system administrator. Mm -hmm. And he discovered minute changes because the accounts all had to go, uh, account for each department for using the mainframe, that fractions.
tens of a cent were showing up and it, it didn't make sense to him. Mm -hmm. And he turned it into a major investigation, mm -hmm. which ended up resulting in one of the first crackdowns on a hacker ring in Germany. Really? Who were hacking into the University of California and stealing mainframe time by allocating fractions of a cent against different departments. So he wrote a book called The Cuckoo's Egg. Cool. Yeah, Cuckoo's Egg. Uh, That's way long, long time ago. Yeah. <coughs> All right. Uh, what's up? A little bit more about, could you share a little more about sort of the footprint and resources each distribution requires? Uh, I, I will in my next, yeah, in my distribution class. Uh, you had a question? I was going to ask uh, what your thoughts were on fast running on Windows now. Oh, yeah. Actually, I was <coughs> intending on mentioning that, but I forgot uh, in the Windows section. So, uh, Linux is starting to win in more places than just server, uh, to the point where Microsoft has now had this huge ad campaign called Microsoft Loves Linux. Uh, and one of the things that came out of this is, some of you may know, some of you may not, but uh, as of last summer, they implemented a full instance of a bash command line in Windows. You, can, uh, you have to go into Windows uh, additional programs and enable it, and it's under experimental features still. But it's there. It works great. I actually wrote the script that adds all of the students to this school's domain uh, using bash inside of Windows. Uh, so yeah, all of all of our classes in the CNET program, we have our own domain because our students take it apart and tear it apart. Uh, how we ended up adding all the students back in when we completely rebuilt the domain this summer was I wrote a script to turn all the students into a CSV and then pass it off to PowerShell. And then PowerShell uploaded everything to the domain. So I was just going to ask about that because I know PowerShell in Windows 10 is super powerful. It is, but now PowerShell also runs in Linux. So yeah. if, if that was the reason to go over to Windows, it's no longer. Because even PowerShell uses Linux commands. <coughs> yep. What's up? I have a real specific end user <coughs> question. Yeah. Because my one of my barriers to switching to Linux is that on Windows, I use Outlook, everything but the email, mm -hmm. calendar, everything, all local to my computer. I do not use the cloud. Okay. And I want to sync my Android phone. I have a on Windows. I have an aftermarket program that mm -hmm. runs that sync. Mm -hmm. How do I do that in Linux? Uh, that's a good question. I would guess that Thunderbird probably has a way of doing it. I, I know. I looked around. Okay. Mm -hmm. Biggest bugaboo I've encountered. I've used Outlook forever. Mm -hmm. Windows is screwed up, by the way, in yeah. later versions. Yeah, I have and, a little, I yeah. really old. Yeah. That's, that's one of the things. Like, it, it's, a free, it's a free program. Yeah. Uh, so, I don't know. Uh, post it online. Maybe somebody <laughs> will agree with you, and then they'll start working on a fix for it. Mm -hmm. And what I've been doing is using, um, is it Caldroid or something like that? Or okay. What did you, uh, what did you call it? Caldroid? Caldroid, I think. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of steps you have to follow. Basically, I did when I, I started Googling it, and I used basically my, the distribution on my computer, which is just kind of shabby then. I put in my cell phone. <coughs> And that started me on the search to figuring out, okay, which programs do I need to install on the computer is the harder end, I think. But basically, Google the different things you're trying to link, and that's a good starting point. Cool. You see, this is this is the community stuff that makes Linux so awesome. Can you repeat that, that movie name? Uh, Revolution OS. What's up? Uh, what about malware and viruses in the Linux environment? So it is far less than Windows. Uh, malware and viruses can affect any operating system. I want to dispel that, that notion right now. People say Macs don't get viruses. They do. It's just most of the time it's not super profitable to write viruses for Macs um, due to its small market share. Linux, on the other hand, has a larger market share, but due to its package manager setup, so long as you're not going and running random scripts that you find off the internet, <laughs> it's fairly hard for people to break into your system. Now, there are things that you can do that make it easier, that if you don't know what you're doing, like uh, if you enable SSH, which is a way of remotely accessing a computer, but don't have strong passwords on your machine, and have it external to the internet, then you can get into trouble. 
but as long as you're just using a computer for as a computer <coughs> in Linux it is far more secure than a Windows counterpart machine what's up Another comment for meeting. Mention the Linux user groups. oh yeah uh, Linux user groups are great if you're local here to Bellingham uh, I'm a member of blug Bellingham Linux users loop <coughs> users group we meet the first Thursday of every month uh, in this building in room 202. One interesting thing about Linux and the C is you can boot from a thumb drive or you can boot from a CD, a write-only yep. CD, which at least protects your operating system from getting corrupted by anything online. Yep. Because when you reboot, it's back to its clean state. So. Yep. What's up? I know you're near distro tomorrow, but can you talk about OpenSUSE and the certification? Oh, tutorial yeah, yeah. Tomorrow? So uh, OpenSUSE has a certification tutorial if you're a bit more of an advanced user. Uh, in the morning in CC202, there's going to be a uh, cram session where they're going to like teach you the basics of it and like try and get you as prepped for it as possible. And then after lunch, there will be an actual free exam where you can get, uh, I forget what the certification is, but you can get essentially OpenSUSE certified as a sysadmin. Know what or not open SUSE, SUSE. Sorry, uh, they, they get really upset when you do that. Uh, so SUSE is the enterprise grade, mm -hmm. open SUSE is, uh, is the end user version. So two is different that, operating systems. Com comparable to other certifications? Yeah. Uh, I, I'd say it's probably comparable to either the Linux Plus or the Red Hat certified admin. Uh, so Brian Lunduke is actually giving an Open SUSE 101 immediately after this one in HC 108, uh, which is across the the quad over in the big building over there. Um, he, he's giving that. And that one <coughs> is one that I would definitely recommend checking out. Uh, and then there's uh, there should actually be a learner track. Uh, I don't think it's displayed here, but if you check the website, you can see what all sessions are targeted at people that are new to new to Linux. All right. Well, I think that's about my time. So, unless there's any more questions, Let's go back to the. Hang on, we only got about halfway through it. Oh. Actually, real quick, I'm going to switch the slide over <coughs> to this. Just in case you ever want to contact me for any reason, my email address is kevin at berkey.land. Uh, yeah, thank you guys for coming. <laughs>